Just go inside for ah. a second. Is it doing that now? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Okay. My first day. This is basic Christian. <laughs> thank you. This is ba basic Christianity. Um, week five, which is man's need, and we're going to be looking at uh, at sin. Uh, so we've talked. We've been looking at the man, Jesus, who is the core of our faith, Jesus of Nazareth. And so far in this series, we've seen that he is God. He is not merely a wise teacher among many wise teachers in history. He's not even an angel or a created being, as some religions say. He is God. That he was raised from the dead, and that has been something that is well attested historically. Those are the things we've been looking at these weeks. So now we're going to turn our attention from Christ to man. We're going to uh, turn our attention from the sinlessness and glory that are in him to the sin and shame that are in us. Uh, we can't understand our need for Jesus until we first understand our own predicament, our own sin. So I have some quotes for you. One is written on your sheet, but before I get to that one, Robert Flackhart, he, was, uh, he preached in the streets of Edinburgh, Scotland in the uh, 19th century, late 18th to 19th century. He said, this is not written down on your sheet, he said, you must preach the law. For the gospel is a silken thread, and you cannot get it into the hearts of men unless you've made a way for it with a sharp needle. The sharp needle of the law will pull the silken thread of the gospel after it. So according to him, why must you preach the law? So that people can understand that they are sinners. They fall short of obeying the law. D.L. Moody said, It is a great mistake to give a man who has not been convicted of sin certain passages that were never meant for him. The law is what he needs. Do not offer the consolation of the gospel until he sees and knows he is guilty before God. We must give enough of the law to take away all self-righteousness. I pity the man who preaches only one side of the truth, always the gospel and never the law. And then the quote that I think is on your sheet, John MacArthur said, God's grace cannot be faithfully preached to unbelievers until the law is preached and man's corrupt nature is exposed. It is impossible for a person to fully realize his need for God's grace until he sees how terribly he has failed the standards of God's law. So the basic idea is to bring to someone and say, Christ uh, died to save you from your sins. And a lot of people might react, well, I don't need saving. I can do that on my, or I don't have sins. Uh, and so the gift of Christ is meaningless to them. And one more quote, Charles Spurgeon said, they will never accept grace till they tremble before a just and holy law. And I'm, I'm wondering just for us to think about in our own lives, um, did, did you have trouble or guilt letting God forgive your sins? Because I, I hear people that say, you know, that they just can't believe in this grace uh, initially, that like, uh, they feel guilt I mean, they have guilt, they recognize the guilt, but then there's that double guilt saying, I, you know, God shouldn't take this away from me. And I'm wondering, do any of you have stories of feeling that when you first believed? Maybe not. I don't. I, I'm just saying some people don't, but uh, you do, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but how can you forgive me? You know, I, mean, I guess I didn't think I could even forgive myself. Yeah. It took a long time. I, I even did counseling. Yeah. I had a, mm -hmm. a year of counseling with mm -hmm. well, Sherry. Right, yeah. You know, as a Christian, there was things I kept bringing up that I had to let go of. I didn't have trouble. Uh, there's no right or wrong answer. Just everyone has their own experience. I, I never had trouble when I heard that Jesus died to pay for my sins. I'll take it. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was just. Uh, I accepted that. I think um, maybe it was in my personality growing up as the baby in the family. I was always looking for ways to do something, get away with something. <laughs> if I could get someone else, like an older brother or sister, to take the blame. <laughs> anyway, so more sin piled in there. But anyway, God, I'm so happy God takes away our sins. Yes. Um, there is a, the, a liberal view learned in universities over the past centuries that says that man is inherently good. Mm. And, and this is common like university thinking here. 
but it's the features of society and societal constraints that make him act bad. And so if you go to a university any time in the last century and take sociology class, that's pretty much the gist of what you get. It is society that turns man bad. Liberals will tell you that we set up monetary systems that involve possession and inequality, and that's what makes us act out in bad ways. Um, as Dennis Prager said, you have to have a PhD from the finest Ivy League university to come up with something that stupid. <laughs> so the logical question is, if man is inherently good, if we're all good at naturally, born as babies, we are good and we are good naturally, then why is society evil? Shouldn't a collection of good people make for a good society, at least some of the time? The Bible tells us the opposite is true. The Bible says that man, ever since Adam's and Eve's fall, is inherently sinful. In fact, it is society, it's the rules of society that we come up with that keep us in line. I've heard people say that all we need is more education, then we'll be perfect. Uh, with the information age, uh, the internet and the ease of Google searching, it was supposed to get us beyond our ignorance and then we could treat our fellow man well. And then you see, well, how's that working? I remember, uh, just sin aside, I remember reading, it was, uh, uh, I think it was the October 1981 uh, issue of National Geographic that I poured over so much as a child as it was about the silicon chip, how the semiconductor computer chip, and I just read it, that's where I remember that. It was October something. I just remember reading it over and over, but it was about how the silicon chip, this computer technology, of the early 80s was going to change and revolutionize the world. And one thing that they said was, uh, and again, this is 1981, they were saying, uh, this is how it's going to be. Soon, uh, there's going to be no street crime, no crime on the streets or anything, no muggings or anything. And the reason is, we're going to be able to do our banking, our money, actually have it in computers instead of in our wallets. So nobody's going to have the need to, uh, to or, uh, or, you know, kill whatever, take each other's wallets on the street, and we'll be crime free. Now that's not addressing getting rid of sin, but this is the way a lot of people think that technology is our answer. We're going to have a utopian society, a wonderful society with no crime, and uh, technology is going to get us there. But what we see is we can have all the technology and education we want. Uh, there's still going to be reason to kill each other and to hurt each other and steal things. Um, technology is not the answer to save us. There's a group of people called futurists, and these are people who love to ponder the future, uh, but often, in my experience, aren't grounded in the reality of here and now. They love to dream about what the future is going to be like and talk about that we are perfecting the human body and mind with medicine and computers, but we really aren't. We're finding new cures for diseases, but we aren't really expanding our minds that much. I always thought that with uh, the internet and Google, I thought this is great, you know, the information age, we're going to have so much, you know, contrast to when, when all of us were growing up. Um, if you want to look something up, you had to, well, we had a set of encyclopedias that I was always there at in the living room bookcase, but you had to go to the library, and now you can just look things up, and it's wonderful. And there's or this you like, can ask your son. Yes, or yes. <laughs> well, but they get it from Google, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, so they're the encyclopedic knowledge, but this wonderful, uh, now we can just look things up, and I remember a decade or two ago thinking, how great this is going to be. We, I, I was even thinking this, we're going to be so smart. We're going to have the information at our fingertips. And now you look at what the kids today are doing with their self, you know, yeah. and I thought, oh, to be that way, that requires being someone who actually is the type who looks things up mm -hmm. and grew up reading encyclopedias, you know, but uh, technology is not the answer to make us a perfect society. We are only getting worse. Evil in the world seems to be getting worse and worse right. every year. Right. Mm -hmm. We have a definite problem, and it is our fallen, sinful nature. Psalm 14.1. You notice, I don't really have too many notes on your sheet. I just give you the Bible verses for this week. Psalm 14 says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. 
The Lord looks down from heaven on the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. All have turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Mm -hmm. Paul wrote in Romans 3, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Mm -hmm. There's no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And John, in 1 John, wrote, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So we all have this sin in our lives. It's pervasive in us. Jesus came and he preached about the law. And um, people say that he, he canceled the law. Well, no, he actually expanded the law. He said that the law points to actions commanded and forbidden, whether good actions we're supposed to do or bad actions we're not supposed to do. But Jesus said that it goes deeper than actions. It goes deep into your heart and about attitudes. So Jesus on the Sermon of the Mount was saying, the law says this, but let's go a little deeper and look at your heart. So some uh, excerpts from Matthew 5 on the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you've heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. So he's getting at the, the core, the heart of why are people murdering? You have heard that it was said do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. It's been said anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness causes her to become an adulteress, and anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. So um, these are just select excerpts that Jesus was saying, here's what the law said, but let's look, there are deeper issues going on than just do this or don't do that. We need to examine your heart. And he was showing that we all, uh, even if you've never murdered someone, we all have things in our heart that need adjusting, and the only adjustment is Jesus dying for our sins. So the law pointed to our inability to please God. Jesus continued to show that even if you think you are righteous, look deeper, you're not. Sin is in all of us. It's the result of Adam and Eve's rebellion in the garden. And we all fall short of the glory of God. Right. Any questions or comments so far? So now the consequences of sin. John Stott, in the book Basic Christianity, which is the book we're going through, he wrote, even if we do not realize the fact now, the most terrible result of sin is that it cuts us off from God. Man's highest destiny is to know God, to be in personal relationship with Him. Our chief claim to nobility as human beings is that we were made in the image of God and are therefore capable of knowing Him. So in contrast to our sin, God is perfectly righteous. He is infinite in his moral perfection. In the Bible, whenever somebody, you just think uh, various Old Testament and New Testament stories, whenever somebody in the Bible catches a glimpse of God's glory, he always shrinks from the sight with an overwhelming consciousness of his own sin. So one example, I don't ask you to come up with other examples, but one example is Job in uh, uh, Job 42, when he... Uh, uh, God was talking to him. He said, My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Mm -hmm. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Mm -hmm. So seeing and hearing from God, he realizes his own sinfulness. All right, so Jeffrey, let's take Popery for 100. Who else in the Bible? Any other stories where you can think of someone who saw God or got a glimpse of God and then, and then turned away? What's that? Oh, yeah. Saul, formerly Saul of yeah. Tarsus on the road to Damascus, all right? 100, do we have popery for 200? Isaiah. <laughs> What's that? Isaiah. Isaiah, yeah. How about a bush that was sort of burning, but not burning up? Oh, <laughs> Moses, yeah. Yeah, um, Ezekiel, John, writing in Revelation. Uh, uh, they all had similar reactions, yeah. Sin not only cuts us off from God, it kills us spiritually. Without the work of Jesus, we are dead in sin. 
And this is a very important point I want to talk about. The Bible doesn't say we are sick in our sin. It doesn't say we are heavily encumbered by our sin. It says we are dead in our sin. Romans 5.12, Paul wrote, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, in this way, death came to all men because all sinned. Colossians 2.13, he wrote, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. John wrote in John 6.53, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. In Ephesians 2.1, Paul wrote, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. <clears throat> So, these writers of the New Testament said that we are dead in our sins, not just very sick. Um, Paul wrote, he was actually commenting the psalm, uh, this is Romans 3.10 through 3.12, and it's going to sound deja vu, because this is, um, uh, I'm sorry, this is uh, like a Psalm 14. He says, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away, they have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Paul's writing that nobody seeks after God. People are searching, uh, people are searching for the benefits of knowing God. Uh, people want peace, they want security, they want food, they want love, they want friendship. And as Christians, we realize that we get all those things from God. So we might mistakenly think that they are looking for God. But uh, our sin nature runs away from God. So you just look back at what I read, Romans 3, 10 through 12. We run away from God by nature. There's no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. So what do you think about that? Any does that bring any thoughts to mind? Any does that sound weird? Well you talk about <clears throat> being dead in sin. Yeah. To me, it's kind of contradictory to what what I think because, you know, even though I sin, my future isn't dead. My future is in Christ. And if I turn away from that sin, then I have a future. Right. So, so it, it's almost kind of different the way you're describing it, or the way I am hearing it. Probably. Right. So the you t so this passage a bit out of context. What he's developing is that apart from Christ, we are dead in our sins. But it's Christ who raises us, and so you do have a future in Christ. You are not dead in your sin. Um, our uh, Christ gives, it's the imputation, he gives us his righteousness. Uh, but he's talking about the, the natural state of man uh, after the fall. So we who believe are not dead, we have been raised. So yeah, good point, thank you. So yeah, so, so when he says nobody seeks after God, and, and you might be thinking, well, I'm seeking after God. Yes, because Jesus has raised you and given you that, uh, has uh, opened your eyes to that and given you that. Many views of predestination fail to take seriously this notion that fallen man is spiritually dead. There are some evangelical positions, you know, uh, different people, they're just different beliefs, different positions, that acknowledge that man is fallen and that his fallenness is a very serious matter. And they may say that man is ill, maybe even mortally ill, but has not quite died yet. Uh, some evangelical positions say that he has a, a tiny breath of spiritual life in his body. He still has a tiny bit of righteousness that allows him to reach for Jesus. An illustration that um, I think I used to use at some point in my life, but I, I no longer believe it's true, is uh, that the a person, when we give someone the gospel, that a person is drowning, a person who's unable to swim, and that God throws them a life preserver, and the life preserver is right there, but the man must still grab hold of the preserver to be saved. What's that? 
they will choose. Yeah. If he refuses the life preserver, he will be saved. Or, I'm sorry, if he refuses, oh, he will not be saved. Um, the problem that I see with that analogy is that the drowning man is not dead. We are told we're dead in our sins. Um, his will and his fingers, his muscle strength in the analogy, are the crucial link to salvation. Um, what I get from the Bible, though, is that, well, also in the analogy, when the man then is saved, he can then bo boast about he mustered up the strength and, uh, and had the muscular strength and courage to grab hold. He had the mental acuity while drowning to grab the life preserver. But Paul says that the man is dead. There's no sense in throwing a life preserver to a dead man. Uh, in this analogy, I think maybe it's more appropriate, God needs to jump into the water. God needs to pull the man up and then do something miraculous, raising him from the dead, and then he's born again. So. Uh, just something to think how my, my thinking about salvation and how much God does has, has changed over the years and decades, but interesting to think about. Romans 8, starting in verse 5, says, Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful man is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. I find that interesting, just as an aside. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Mm -hmm. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, sorry, if the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. So we are dead in our sins, naturally, um, you know, before Christ saves us. Another um, uh, consequence of sin is conflict with others. So the big one is we are cut off from God, but also conflict with others. This is, uh, it's all around us. And I think just this weekend, uh, how this has been brought to my mind, and if you think a little bit, it's everywhere, um, that... Sin cuts us off from each other. Uh, I was reading in the book of Judges last night and how Israel was fighting against the tribe of Benjamin. They rose up against each other. Uh, and we have wars all the time. Uh, when I was at uh, Don's memorial service, the, uh, the, one of the hats that showed that he was Korean War veteran, and I was thinking, okay, the Korean War that's still going on. It, you know, Don, so many decades ago, served in the Korean War. That never got resolved. And I think, well, that just goes back to World War II, and that just goes back to World War I. And you can take it back, and there's no asking. I'm a student of history. I love history. There's no asking, when did that conflict start? You can trace it back, and it pretty much goes back to Adam and Eve's rebellion. <laughs> there's no looking at historically, when did the mess in Korea, when did that start? It, you can trace it back to the war prior. It's always going on. The American Civil Wars, we've been, uh, in my family, we've been looking at Abraham Lincoln this weekend and the Civil War, uh, which reminds me of Israel fighting against Benjamin. Sin, just, it's all around us, and it leads to conflict with others. The mass murders that you read in the news happening like uh, they've never been before. Our country is divided ideologically so that we can't even find common ground anymore on what is good and evil, what it means to be an American. This is all the result of sin. And to a lesser extent, sin is prevalent. I'm reminded of it every time I lock my door. <laughs> I, I turn a lock. Every time I enter my password, that is a result of sin because a password is something to keep bad guys out of my business and property. It's all over the result of sin in our lives. Matthew 22, starting in verse 35, one of them, an expert in the law, tested Jesus with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. 
love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Love is such an important part, especially you read, well, read all the New Testament letters and, and uh, 1 John and what Paul wrote. Love is commanded so much. And a big part of that is because we are prone, that, that's such a hard thing with us, because we are separated from each other by sin. God's order is that we put him first, others second, and ourselves last. Sin is the reversal of that order. Self first, and then others, and then God somewhere in the background. What man needs is a radical change of nature. Um, we cannot work it within ourselves. We need a savior. All right, any, any thoughts, concerns, questions? Throwing tomatoes? Okay. All right. So the topic today has been um, sin, and I, I want to close on uh, something happy. So, because <laughs> oh, <laughs> we can't just end it here, but, uh, you know, so, but this was the topic for today in the ongoing series, so please come back in subsequent weeks. But I want to close by giving you this passage to ponder, and also it ends on a happy note. It relates to what we're just talking about, but also ends happily. Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. And I just want to point out the past tense there. Like the rest, we were by nature. You know, kind of going back to what you were saying. Object of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms of Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. All right, so that'll do it for today, for this week. Any questions, thoughts, complaints? Okay. We turn that, you can turn that off. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, y'all.